If you are looking for the correct way to select, place and route your current sensing shunt register, then stick around as I will be sharing a bunch of tips and tricks that I have learned while designing and building my own projects over the years. A shunt resistor can be used in multiple ways, but for the purpose of this video we are interested in using it for measuring current. That means it needs to be inserted in series with the device under test. It can either be inserted in a high side configuration as shown in this example, but it can also be inserted in a low side configuration. And these two topologies have their advantages and disadvantages. Here is a side by side comparison when used in a low side configuration. There is the effect of the ground offset which depending on your application may or may not pose problems. When used in a high side configuration you must use a differential input amplifier for sensing the voltage drop while in a low side configuration you can get away with a single ended amplifier. Another thing that might be important in a high side configuration you have the ability to detect a short on the load while on the low side configuration you can't do that. Also, in a low side sensing configuration, you are not able to sense and account for additional leakage currents through stray secondary paths from the load to ground. And this list might not be complete, there might be other differences to consider between these two topologies, but these are just the things I have encountered and I have considered in my own designs. If you would like to manufacture your newly designed PCB, I highly recommend you check out the sponsor of this video, PCBWay.com, where you can order high quality PCBs with fast turnaround time. They even offer advanced capabilities like aluminum substrate or flex PCBs, definitely worth checking them out. But let's say you figure out the topology you want to use and you are now faced with choosing your current shunt resistor. Can you just pick your typical metal film 1 ohm resistor from your favorite distributor or even better from your already existing parts bin? Well, you can but you won't get the best results. Probably the most important factor you want to consider when choosing your shunt resistor is the temperature coefficient or the TEMCO as engineers like to refer to it. This will tell you how much your resistor value is going to change with variations in temperature. Every system you build will probably see a variation in temperature at board level and so if you calibrate your system to calculate the current for a given resistor value and that resistor value changes with temperature, you are going to introduce significant errors in your measurements. Parts distributors will typically have a special category for shunt resistors and in there you will find special built resistors with low TEMCO and oftentimes other advantages. Those are the ones you ideally want to use because a normal resistor might have a TEMCO of about 200 ppm while a specially rated shunt resistor might be an order of magnitude better in the 20 ppm range. Power rating is also something you will need to consider at this step. You will need to calculate the power dissipation on your resistor and account for the worst case scenario. I typically like to have a minimum of 25% margin on top of my worst case scenario with power rating. Tolerance is usually not that important as it doesn't matter if your resistor is 1.1 ohms or 1 ohm you can calibrate that later in software. The important thing is that once you calibrate, that value doesn't change. Usually shunt resistors will also be built in a way to ensure a low inductance through their body so that you don't introduce additional noise into the measurement system. Another thing you might care about, especially if you are working with a very low value shunt resistor and you want high accuracy sensing, is if your shunt resistor has a 4-wire Kelvin connection or not. A 4-wire connection is preferred to separate the current path from the sense path and eliminate any errors from your measurement. And here is an example of such a resistor. But typically a 4-wire shunt resistor will be more expensive than a 2-wire one because it probably requires a more complex manufacturing process and so even if you wanted to use a 4-wire shunt resistor because it is better, your budget might not allow you to use one. If that's the case, I'll show you a few routing techniques you can use to get the most out of your resistor and have the least amount of errors possible for a two-wire resistor. 
But before we get to the routing, first let me share a few tips about placement of the shunt register on a PCB. First, I would recommend following general best practices and guidelines for PCB layout. Like for example, keep high current tracks as short as possible by optimizing placement of the components that share these paths. Use a calculator like the one that's built into KiCad or Saturn PCB Toolkit to find out the track width you need for your specific PCB properties and track length. Watch out for this section of the calculator, which is related to temperature. Even if a lower width track can handle the current, it will do so with a certain temperature rise, which might or might not be acceptable depending on your design. Remember what I said earlier about picking a good shunt resistor with a low TEMCO. Even if it has a low TEMCO, it doesn't mean it's zero, so it's best to avoid unnecessary heating of the resistor to keep the errors to a minimum. Also related to temperature, try to keep components and areas of the circuit that you know are going to get hot away from your shunt resistor for the same reasons mentioned above. Now let's consider a few different scenarios for routing tracks from shunt resistors. First I want to discuss a common mistake you might encounter when doing low side sensing. This example circuit uses a two terminal sense resistor in a low side configuration and I've seen this a lot, people will route the first sense line up to the amplifier input and for the second sense line instead of routing a separate sense line up to the input of the amplifier they just connect that amp input with any ground track on the PCB, whichever is closer and convenient to route. CAD programs because of the way they work will encourage you to route to the closest point on the same net name which often can be the, the ground plane on the bottom of the board. So now what you get is an important offset in one of the sense lines because the signal has to travel this different length path which is shared with other parts of the circuit and other currents. Measurements from this type of circuit will almost always show significant errors. The correct way to do this is to route a separate sense line back to the amplifier input even though this is technically connecting to the same net which is ground in our case. And there is another thing you can do to optimize this circuit and make it even better but I'll talk about that in our next example. Let's take a look at another circuit, this time with a 4 wire type shunt resistor in SMD package sitting in a high side configuration coupled with a dedicated current sense differential amplifier. In this case, you'll want to route your thick current carrying traces to the force terminals of the resistor and the sense wires to the sense terminals. It's important that you don't mix these up. They are generally different sized terminals, so the sense terminals can't handle the higher currents and you don't want these connected together. Keep them separate. Now, you might be wondering if you should length match the two sense signals going up to your amplifier. And the answer is, it depends. Ideally, you would have a very high impedance input to your instrumentation amplifier, so it shouldn't matter if the one sense line is longer than the other and there is a difference in their resistance. Since there would be almost no current flowing through those lines, there shouldn't be any voltage drop that would offset your measurement. But in real world conditions, this might not be perfect, you might not have the best amplifier with a very high input impedance. So as a good practice, I always try to length match the two sense lines because it only takes a few extra seconds to do it. Next, let's consider a scenario where for some reason you need to use a bunch of shunt resistors in parallel, either to get the required value or to maximize the current dissipation capability. I'm using 10 resistors in the circuit. They are two thermal type shunt resistors and as you can see they are all wired in parallel. Where would you connect the force lines in this case or the sense lines and why? The goal here is to share the load equally among all of our resistors and we know current will always prefer the path of least resistance. So a first option for the force terminals would be this to connect right in the middle of the shared connection with appropriately sized tracks. But this type of layout is not always possible, like in the case of a circuit I designed just a couple of weeks ago, I had to have the input and output force terminals on opposite sides of the pack lengthwise. If that's the constraint, you can route them like this, to have optimal distribution of current across all of our resistors. But what would happen if we try to route the force terminals like this? Well, in this case, the resistors sitting closer to the force terminals would be carrying more current than the ones sitting at the back. 
because they would provide a shorter path for the current, one of least resistance, and we don't want that. Now let's consider the layout of the sense lines. You might think to yourself it would be a good idea to just route the sense lines for the middle point of the pack like I'm showing here, but what if you decide to populate just one of the resistors instead of the whole pack? Your sense connections would then be routed right in the middle of the high current path and we already know that's something we want to avoid. So it's best to just connect to the first or last resistor in the pack, that way it doesn't matter if you are using one resistor or 10 resistors, the result will be the same and sense wires will be routed away from the high current path. And finally, as promised earlier, let me show you how you can further optimize the sense lines layout in the case of the two terminal shunt resistor by optimizing the footprint of the shunt resistor. There are a few things to consider here. First, we want to route away from the high current path, we want to avoid unnecessary resistance caused by the copper pad and we want to avoid the resistance introduced by the solder joint itself between the pad and the terminal on the resistor. The best way to do this practically is to route the sense lines to the middle of the pad on the interior side which is away from the high current path and we can minimize the effects of the solder connection resistance by designing a custom pad that will look something like this. Notice how the sense terminals are isolated inside the main current carrying pad of the shunt resistor. This type of pad design will effectively turn a two terminal resistor into a proper four terminal resistor but placement and alignment of the resistor on top of the pad will be critical and there is the risk of creating a solder bridge which would be hard to spot under that resistor. Now if you think you can control the soldering process to avoid a solder bridge and you have excellent alignment with the pad, then go with this method for best results. If however you will want a method where there is less to go wrong with placement of the part and soldering, just connect the sense lines to the inside of the resistor pads, nothing fancy. I'm sure some of my viewers will know more about shunt resistors than I do, so I encourage them to share their views in the comments below if they think they have something worth sharing. But even following just the tips and tricks that I've shared in this video alone will get you pretty close to a perfect result and most importantly will help you avoid making common mistakes. If you found this video useful don't forget you can support this channel on Patreon with as little as $1 per month to encourage me to produce more free content like this. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time with a new video.